Okay, I can see people are still pouring in, but we might get started because we've just tipped over to 12.02, according to, to my clock. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Amon Waterford. I'm the Director of Policy and the Deputy CEO with the Committee for Sydney. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, a uh, very exciting event today uh, with some really excellent speakers. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, although we're obviously meeting online and you will be in possibly a different part of Sydney or a different part of the world. Uh, I'm currently on Gadigal land and I pay my respect to those elders. Uh, we've got three speakers today and what we're going to do is ask them to provide some initial remarks and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience and I think what, what should prove to be an interesting um, topical and, and robust debate around tax reform, the opportunities and challenges that uh, we're faced with following uh, COVID. So for our three speakers, what I'll do is I'll just introduce it, all of them uh, first up and then we'll, I'll ask them each the same question to provide some opening remarks. And then uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the bottom of your screen. You'll see there's a Q&A button. If you type your question into there, then I can ask it once we finish with the remarks. So our three speakers, uh, Dr. Ken Henry is uh, an advisor of the Business Council of Australia on COVID recovery. He was obviously previously the Treasury Secretary and Chairman of NAB. He's well known for having penned the Henry Tax Review and I suspect we'll have some thoughts on, uh, on reflections on how that uh, it, it resulted in, in or, or, or did not result in the, the uh, economic reformed hoped. Dr John Hewson is currently a professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU, an adjunct professor at Curtin, UTS, Canberra, Griffiths Universities. He's the chair of the Business Council of Sustainable Development Australia, the chair of Bioenergy Australia, patron of the Smart Energy Council and the Ocean Nourishment Foundation. John Hewson obviously was also famously opposition leader of Australia. Uh, and there is an enormous wealth of uh, experiences that these speakers have had that I can't touch on because uh, we, we don't want to spend the entire hour just reading out their bios. Alf Capito is our third speaker. He's the director of EY's tax policy group in Australia and has been a practitioner and public commentator on tax matters for many years. He is the guy when it comes to tax reform at EY and has been really uh, instrumental in helping shape Australia's international tax rules and served on the Johnson Committee for the review of Australia's financial services centre regime. He's also been really important in supporting the Committee for Sydney and the work that we've undertaken on uh, the innovation economy, um, supporting us to draft a tax reform agenda around supporting innovation for Sydney and for Australia. So welcome uh, folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you two questions that are related to each other for some remarks. And I'm gonna come to you first, Ken. The questions really are, you've been involved in previous tax reform processes to varying degrees of success. What would you say the most important lessons from your experiences uh, that federal and state governments should learn? And what do you think the most important tax reform is that should be prioritised in the near future following COVID? To you, Ken. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and it's, uh, it's now afternoon, so good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. And uh, I come to you uh, today from the land of the Biripai people on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, lovely part of the world. But... Um, uh, anyway, it's good, it's good to be with you. And this is, uh, this is a rather important topic. Uh, lessons first. You know, I could spend a week on lessons. Uh, I'll just give you four. <laughs> four, uh, although uh, there are subparts to these four. The first and the most important is that tax reform is really, really, really hard work. Really hard work. Uh, second, and this partly explains the first, is that no matter who stands up with a tax reform proposal, they're going to face strong political opposition. For a government, political opposition is, of course, guaranteed, but in no topic more so than tax. No topic more so than tax. And obviously, you're going to need a strategy for dealing with it. The political opposition uh, will focus on questions of fairness principally and to a lesser extent complexity and certainty or uncertainty. Uh, the political champions of any reform proposal have to be across the detail. They have to be capable of arguing the case at any level of granularity. That means the big broad brush strokes, you know, the big picture stuff, but right down to the finest level of detail. In the past, um, the strategy to meet claims of <clears throat> unfairness was to overcompensate from the budget. 
um, pre-COVID, that meant that tax reforms could be prosecuted only if you had a pretty big budget surplus to spend in overcompensation. I think things are different today. Um, obviously, we're nowhere near a budget surplus position today. Uh, yet I think people are coming to the realisation that there is a strong economic case for um, even adding to the budget deficit in the short term uh, in order to secure support for an investment in a, in a better future tax system. So I think where we are today is a little different from where we've been uh, at any point since uh, 1985, which is when I started working on tax reform. My third lesson is that you need to understand that the media is interested overwhelmingly in theatre and conflict. Uh, much more so than in the substance of proposals. I think we should just accept that that's, that's a fact. It means that the media are generally more useful to those who attack a proposal than they are to those who advance it. Uh, but of course, those who advance a proposal can use this to advantage. Uh, they can fashion themselves as an attacker. And I've seen this work a couple of times quite effectively. What you attack, of course, is the present system. A successful tax reform starts with a rhetorical demolition of the current system. If you don't demolish the current system first, nobody's going to be interested in your reform proposal. And then my fourth lesson, which really puts all of that together, and this really is the most important lesson, and many people have noted it, you do need a really compelling narrative, and it has to be based on a strong case for action. Uh, essentially, you need a burning platform of some sort. Uh, now, it seems to me that the construction of a compelling case for change should not be difficult. Should not be difficult right now. The current system that we have is at least partly responsible for several of our most pressing economic, social uh, and environmental problems. And perhaps it, more importantly, it will hobble efforts to deal with others, including in the post-COVID um, economic recovery. Our present system's a major contributor to increasing burdens of complexity, uh, uncertainty, uh, business compliance costs. It's undermining workforce participation when workforce participation is coming under pressure anyway because of population aging. Our system has undermined our productivity performance and in doing so it's damaged real wages growth. The undermining has occurred principally through uh, an impact on business investment that has led to the lowest levels of business investment that Australia has seen since the recession of the early 1990s and that was pre-COVID. Nothing to do with COVID, we were already at levels of business investment we hadn't seen since the recession of the early 1990s. If that's not enough, the present system is driving worsening housing affordability. It is a contributor to worsening land degradation, the loss of fragile ecosystems, even to species extinction. And it's very, very poorly suited to driving climate change mitigation and adaptation. Increasingly, uh, the Commonwealth's fiscal strategy uh, and, and this is pre-COVID, um, and we await to see uh, next month uh, what the government's fiscal strategy in COVID and post-COVID will be. But, but pre-COVID, the Commonwealth's fiscal strategy relied pretty much exclusively on the hidden but rather ruthless mechanics of fiscal drag. That was about it. Um, and, and if you have a look at the most recent Commonwealth budget, um, and again, prepared pre-COVID, obviously. Uh, that projected that tax receipts would rise from 21.3% of GDP in 2012-13 by two percentage points to 23.3% of GDP in the present year. And the government's fiscal strategy caps the tax to GDP ratio at 23.9%. <laughs> There are presumably reasons for that, who knows. Uh, but where does that tax revenue come from? Well, the proportion of the tax take contributed by personal income tax. Back in 2007-08, it was 44.3% of total tax collections. 
That was 2007, 44.3%. By 2012-13, it had grown to 48.1%. And according to the most recent budget, again, pre-COVID, uh, the government was estimating that it would grow again to 49% in the present year. And the government's budget projected that it would increase every year over the forward estimates, despite scheduled tax cuts. So there's no, there's no hiding the fiscal drag and the importance of fiscal drag in underpinning the government's fiscal strategy, but there's not much else. It is fiscal drag. And on the other hand, if we look at our least distortionary indirect tax, the GST, we find the opposite occurring because the GST is suffering base erosion. Only about half of household consumption spending is now covered by the GST. Uh, as a consequence, state budgets have suffered. But worse than that, state budgets are experiencing um, or are exposed to increasing volatility due to their reliance on stamp duties and resource royalties. And these are quite probably the two worst taxes in the Federation. Yet that's, this is what underpins state budgets. Um, these trends are unsustainable. So I don't think it'd be difficult to mount a rhetorical case against the present system. Um, but that needs to be done. What do I think is most, uh, the most important tax reform to prioritise in the near future? Well, look, we're talking about a system. And the system, as I've said, is unsustainable. And I think without that point being accepted uh, and the sources of system fragility understood, there really can be no appreciation of the case for repairing just one bit of it. So I think there is a danger in, in us uh, having a discussion about just one bit of the system. But let me say some things. Obviously, we need a system that encourages employment, investment, innovation and growth. And of course, everybody would nod their heads to that. We also need a system that's fair and it has to be fair intergenerationally, uh, not just for the present generation. Importantly too, we need a system that's capable of raising more revenue than the present system without damaging economic, social and environmental consequences. This point is not, I think, as well understood and accepted as it needs to be. The report that um, we published uh, 10 years ago now, um, when I say we, that the 50 or so people who were with me in, in the, um, the tax review of future tax system, um, it met all of those requirements, all of those requirements that I've mentioned. And had that report been implemented in full, um, we would certainly be in a very different place uh, today. And I won't go through it in detail, but just, just to, to set the scene, like today, and it is a decade, today, um, uh, there would be no payroll taxes in the Federation. Uh, there'd be no other state consumption taxes. For example, there'd be no insurance levies. There would be no state-based resource royalties. We would actually have a national resource rent tax. Um, the company tax rate would be 25% for all companies. Um, we, there would be no stamp duties on property transfers. They would have been replaced by a national progressive land tax. Um, there would be no fuel excises. There'd be no stamp duties on motor vehicles. There'd be no luxury car tax. There'd be no vehicle registration taxes. All of those things would have been replaced by road user charges. Um, we would still have a comprehensive carbon emissions trading scheme because we did touch on that in the report. Capital income and expenses <clears throat> would have symmetrical tax treatment with a, a common discount applying to capital gains, interest and rent. Scholarships, pensions, allowances, other transfer payments, all of those things would be exempt from tax. I could go on. I won't. We've lost a decade. All of that could have been achieved in the past decade and all of it is more urgent today. But here's where I, I will now come to the answer to the question. The truth is that it could only have been achieved by governments at Commonwealth and state levels working together. So this does bring me to the reform that needs prioritising above all others. In the past 12 months, as we've had to confront the consequences of drought, uh, of bushfires, of floods and now the pandemic, 
we've seen quite a lot of finger pointing between different levels of government, not all the time, but often enough. And finger pointing is a constant feature of the history of taxation in Australia. Actually, the Howard government's GST stands out as a rare exception. The system changes required today simply cannot be achieved by one government acting alone. A federal effort is necessary, it's inescapable. So the reform that I would prioritise today is to have the National Cabinet step up and accept full responsibility for the nation's future tax system. Thanks, Ken. That's, uh, that's a fascinating challenge to put to people. I think um, you had your four lessons. I actually think uh, the, the demolition of the current system definitely qualifies as a, as a fully fledged uh, uh, step in that process. So uh, can I propose it's actually five with some sub points. Um, John, I'm going to turn to you next. Your reflections on the, the same question. Uh, for those that have joined us, we're asking uh, you've all been involved in tax reform processes. There are lessons learned. What, what lessons would you share with current uh, leaders from your experiences and what would be a tax reform that you would prioritise at this moment in time? Thanks, Eamon. Um, look, I'm a bit inclined to just tick all the boxes that Ken's just listed. <laughs> uh, I think we've shared uh, similar experiences. In many ways. <laughs> My first involvement in tax reform was un in the Fraser years and the Fraser government very difficult circumstances where basically the budget focus was to get rid of the deficit after the profligate years of the Whitlam spending. Uh, you remember the Razor Gang and uh, everyone thought that Phil Lynch went too hard and too fast and of course six months later everyone realised he hadn't done anywhere near enough and they spent the next seven years uh, trying to uh, pull the budget back into shape. It was still out of shape when they lost election in 83. Um, it was a, a very painful process. We did try to argue on the basis of then the ASPE review of the tax system, which came down in 75, uh, fundamentally proposing a broadening of the tax base away from income-based taxes to expenditure-based taxes. That was a novel attempt in the Fraser years to run that argument. It got close a couple of times, but it was very difficult. And we had to deal with situations where I remember one day Malcolm Fraser came in and he said, what we need is a broad based tax. And the broadest tax base I can think of is money. So please think of a way you can tax money. <laughs> I thought we minimised as much damage as we could in those days while ending up with a financial institutions duty, which fortunately has been abolished since. But it was a surreal debate, and I'm, I'm afraid that a lot of the debates I've been involved in since are surreal at the political level. I mean, Ken made the point of, um, of um, how easy it is really to use tax in the political sense as the basis of a scare campaign. My, my attempt in fight back to introduce a broad-based tax reform as part of a, a broad-based you know, reform of most areas of public policy um, was easily neutered by a very effective tax campaign. And um, yeah, I naively perhaps relied on, on Keating to a large extent. He, when he lost his attempt in 85 to broaden the tax base, uh, the famous uh, motel room deal done between Hawke and Kelty to kill it off, uh, he made a very passionate statement that he'd die fighting for a GST, a broad-based uh, consumption tax. I naively believed that was sensible <laughs> and that he'd stick with it not realising, of course, that he immediately saw that as the most effective way to unseat me, or as he would say, do me slowly, uh, which is uh, what he did fairly effectively. Uh, my motivation these days is simply to move beyond birthday cakes and try and get to some sensible uh, um, national discussion about tax. I mean, Ken's listed, you know, the main weaknesses of the tax system. We know there's just too much dependence in the personal tax system on bracket creep and the numbers that Ken gave should be alarming. Unfortunately, you know, the political debate today, the government says, well, we've basically ticked the, ticked the tax reform box. We're going to bring forward those tax cuts uh, from 2023, 2024, whatever they were, concentrated really on the higher income earners to the benefit of higher income earners. And that's tax reform. <laughs> yeah. And we know that that's only going to compound the problem. Of course, bracket creep will presumably continue through that process and negate the significance of even those, those tax changes. And um, we saw the experience of the last election where the Labor Party tried to do a few specific tax changes, not really big ones as it turned out, but they were easily the basis of a scare campaign. Um, uh, you know, the, the combination was the threat of uh, perhaps a, 
uh, a wealth tax or a death duty, uh, you know, became a exaggerated beyond belief in terms of the political debate. But that is the main constraint on tax. And uh, I think if you are to think about what needs to be done, I mean, you can go through each of the areas of tax. What's wrong with personal tax? Well, we know that you know, too much reliance on bracket creep. We know that the because we have a large tax-free zone, tax rates cut in, personal tax rates cut in uh, at, uh, at high rates at low income levels. Uh, and, um, you know, we know that probably the corporate tax system based on profit is largely unsustainable in the medium term. We know that the GST uh, is no longer the growth tax it was promised to be. In fact, as Ken said, it's on 50, less than 50% of household expenditure. And the bid it's on is not growing as fast as the bid it's not on. So the revenue base doesn't, doesn't go up. Um, you've got these nuisance taxes at the state government. It is a shared responsibility between state and federal government. We have nuisance taxes like stamp duties, insurance duties, and so on which are quite distortionary, perhaps payroll tax, although notionally payroll tax is potentially in a very effective tax base, except it gets neutered as the states compete with each other to attract business or, or whatever. We don't have congestion taxes or road charges. We have an ineffective resource rent tax. Um, we obviously don't have a carbon tax or a price on carbon. There are a lot of weaknesses in the system which make the present system unsustainable. But how you get from that obvious technical analysis of the weakness of the system. We know it on top of that, apart from the inherent weaknesses of each of those tax areas, if you like, we know it's unfair, we know it's complex. Uh, and, uh, you know, to mount a, a public argument in support of broad-based reform, as T Ken said, I think, to, uh, what was the word, uh, demolish, <laughs> demolish the, uh, the tax base uh, as, as a starting point. I mean, most people would concede all those weaknesses, but there's not sufficient movement in the broader community. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of tax debate in, in political terms is that, you know, if, if you're lowering tax, it's tax reform. If you're not lowering tax, it's not. And of course, the reality is in the context, not pre-COVID, but was a reality, it's still an even greater reality now. You are going to be have to have to look at ways in, of increasing the tax base over the next 10 or 15 years, not, not reducing it. So you need to do that in a way that is visibly fair and equitable. So I think that there are a lot of, 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 of challenges there and the attempts that have been made in the past to build uh, a consensus between the states and the federal government have, have, have not worked. I mean, I remember Mike Baird proposed increasing uh, the GST, uh, as he was concerned principally about his, you know, locked in uh, health expenditures, if you like. Surprisingly, Jay Weatherill, a Labor uh, leader, came in on support of that and it was dispensed with by the, by the then uh, LNP government. More recently, Perrette has actually uh, proposed a similar thing in the context of his uh, federation reform proposals. Uh, that didn't go anywhere either. That was immediately ruled out. Uh, I remember Turnbull saying with great gusto when he was elected uh, leader that all options are on the table. They came off the table faster than they were put on the table. Uh, politically, this is a very, very, very difficult area to contemplate. Yet having said that, you would think that COVID does provide a real opportunity to actually move in the direction of genuine reform in a number of areas, including tax. Um, the concept of a national cabinet, if you make it a true national cabinet, where you actually can develop bipartisan support for proposals and agree on, you know, collaborate on their development and implementation and so on. That's a framework that can be used. And of course, there's an imperative, I think, to reset. I mean, you aren't going to snap back or bounce back from this sort of uh, the deepest economic recession since the Great Depression and uh, with a host of social consequences. So you have a unique opportunity to, for, to lead that process. And uh, tax is a key element of that, I think, and it offers a, a, a lot of longer term benefits in terms of productivity and incentive and, and, and so on, uh, participation, intergenerational equity, all the things that, that are going to matter in this country, but they get ignored um, uh, in, in the current debate. But there is an imperative to do something in a, in a reset sense. And, um, you know, I still go back to the GST. I mean, I do think that the, the need is there to broaden the tax base. I would actually look at the possibility of broadening the, the base as far as possible and increasing the rate. 
and end up with about 100 billion net of compensation to spend on the, to fund the restructure of the rest of the tax system, to abolish some taxes and to reconfigure personal and um, corporate taxes and so on. There's a capacity to do that. The idea of compensation is a, is a real one. Um, work we've done at ANU suggested about 30% of the net revenue you generate would be required to more than fully compensate the bottom two quintiles of the tech, of, of the income distribution. So you've got plenty of net cash to pay with, if you like, play with, if you like. But, um, you know, the other opportunity, I think, in doing that, um, which I tried to make the point in, in uh, the fightback package, is it's also an opportunity to link it to reform of tr the transfer system. In the early uh, 90s, for example, pensioners were particularly disadvantaged after they'd paid for residential aged care or whatever in terms of the level of the pension. So rather than just give them the 15% GST compensation, we proposed doubling the pension and uh, giving them uh, full access to private health insurance. So that it was an opportunity to reset, if you like, within the transfer system as an example of how that could be done. And those opportunities are there and they're pressure points as well as the tax system. It's dangerous to look at the tax system in isolation, uh, while, the, you know, as we said, it's a pretty difficult task uh, to actually contemplate just tax reform, but it needs to be looked at in the context of the Federation. And the fact that you're seeing the, some of the cracks of our Federation emerge, even in the COVID response, um, you know, you do have overlapping responsibilities. You do have duplication. To the extent that you could eliminate some of those and reduce aggregate public sector spending, that would be the appropriate framework, I think, within which you should be looking at uh, the aggregate impact of tax reform. So there are a lot of opportunities to do this. There's an imperative, I think, to do it, but there's no political will. And my view is unless you can get a level of bipartisan support through something like the National Cabinet, and you've got to look at an independent structure by which a commission, perhaps by which you drive tax and welfare reform. And um, it's not, not, not going to be easy to get that done either. But the issues become far more important than being left to, you know, the day to day politics of this country. Thank you. Fascinating, John. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think you've touched on a bunch of topics, both of you around um, an aging population and the federation that, that 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 feed into these questions, not least, of course, COVID also plays into so much of this. Um, I uh, can see a bunch of questions streaming through, but before we jump to that, I'm really keen to bring Alf into this conversation. Alf, your reflections: what are the your lessons that you you've learned? What are the things you think leaders today need to be aware of as they, if they want to embark on tax reform, and what do you think important reforms might be? Uh, you're muted, Alf. Just uh, unmute yourself. Having listened to uh, John and Ken, you know, that's, uh, they've covered a lot of ground, which is, uh, and I agree with everything they've said. Um, but let, let me just add a couple of things then. Um, you know, John just mentioned towards the end there, you know, the process of, you know, how do you get this thing done? Well, sh short of bipartisan agreement, um, it, it's very difficult for, for, for what Ken said. You know, we have a history in this country of knocking off people uh, around uh, election time on taxes. And so, you know, no, one, no opposition is gonna give up their, their opportunity to do that easily. And even if they agreed, frankly, with what the policy was uh, as being a good policy. So question whether that's ever gonna happen again. Um, as a firm, you know, we started about four or five years ago, really pushing hard this notion of some sort of independent tax commission that would be a body of experts that would come down with proposals that were good for the country with, you know, a, 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 on a consensus basis with the stakeholders around that particular commission uh, that then would have the gravity of respect within the community to be carried forward. Uh, but um, everyone liked that except the politicians. Why didn't they like it? Right, because they didn't want to give up the power of, you know, setting their own tax policies. Um, and, we, and, 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 you know, we weren't suggesting that, for example, that commission would override them or have the power to, to, to put policy in place that they disagreed with, but that it would come up with the recommendations, a bit like what Ken did 10 years ago. Um, and um, so, so, so unless there is some change in the mechanism by which we come up with policy and 
get and deliver a, a sort of community accepted result. You know, if you had a community accepted result, it would be difficult for the politicians to then um, bicker amongst themselves about it, just as we saw with COVID. Uh, you know, once the community got around the notion of, you know, closing the borders, uh, doing certain things, well, no one was going to really try and um, make political do of that because the community would have seen through that. So I think there is a political challenge around how you get tax reform done in this country. And it's a shame that we've had a history of elections being lost and won on, on tax uh, battles. It's, it's a real shame. Um, Ken said we've lost 10 years. Absolutely, we have lost 10 years. And in that 10 years, not only have we lost to the 10 years, but other countries have moved forward, right? And we've gone even further back. So 10 years ago, our corporate tax rate was probably globally competitive. 10 years on, it's hopeless, right? We're at 30%, you know, the US is at 21%, the UK is at 19%, right? US and UK, they're not tax havens. And they're 10 percentage points plus, you know, below, uh, below our corporate tax rate. So our personal tax rates are high, right? So uh, if you're, and, and, and 10 years on, global investment is, is even more mobile than what it was before. So if you have mobile investment where people can decide, well, they're going to do their, uh, set up their operation uh, in, in five or six potential countries, actually, they kind of like Australia, but, you know, the tax system makes it um, ridiculously expensive to do it. Or, 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 or even where an individual who runs a, a particular skill set wants to live, um, you know, uh, you know, if you want to be a funds manager, you'd probably be better off in Singapore or Hong Kong, or maybe less so Hong Kong these days. But if you're going to be a fund manager in this part of the world, um, why wouldn't you come to Sydney? We've got three trillion dollars worth of funds management uh, dollars, um, and we're pretty good at funds management. But you know, if you can sit in Singapore and get taxed at sixteen percent and not be not pay tax on your foreign income and your capital gains, why would you come to Australia and get taxed? you know, at 45% plus on everything. So um, mobile investment um, looks for a home. And when it looks for a home, it looks at the uh, ultimate uh, cash yield return on the investment and tax is a big part of that. And unless you've got a globally competitive tax system, you aren't gonna get that investment. And in fact, it's the opposite that we're seeing now. You know, we are seeing people that have invested in Australia and have come up with things that can be exploited globally, wanting to emigrate those things uh, because the tax system um, is so expensive to, to, to leave that uh, asset here and to enjoy the revenue of that asset over a long period of time here. Um, so the world has got mobile, uh, more mobile, and therefore, you know, if you want to be a, a, a country to attract investment, you have to be globally competitive when it comes to taxation. And unfortunately, we're not. And worse still, uh, we raise more tax uh, from, from corporates uh, and individuals uh, as a percentage of GDP than a lot of other countries. In fact, most other countries, right? So we're, the, the tax base that we need to reduce to be competitive, uh, the corporate tax base, and the, 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 the tax base that applies to entrepreneurs is the very tax base we're currently relying on to basically pay the bills. Right? So it's crazy. We need to shift our reliance from that tax base onto something else. And you know, Ken and, and, and John have touched on this, the, the answers as to what that should be, and then become smarter with reducing the, 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 the tax levies on investment so that we can uh, continue to attract or, uh, you know, attract investment. Uh, and in, in things such as innovation, R&D, startups, we're actually good at that stuff. Uh, but once we get, once, once it reaches a certain level where it, where it can be exploited overseas, then it tends to leave this country simply uh, well, primarily because of the tax system here. Um, so that's the challenge for us. Not only do we have an over-reliance on uh, 
income and profits taxes, which is draining the investment uh, dollars. Um, but we, we have that over-reliance right now, right at the time when we need to create jobs and we need more investment. So we, we've painted ourselves into a corner. And frankly, I thought, you know, yes, we need a medium term strategy to change the system long term, but we need a short term strategy to make sure that we're at, that, that investment uh, dollars, um, uh, it, it, the tax system is, is, is not adverse to investment dollars being spent. So we're going to, I mean, there's talk about things such as investment allowances and, 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 and incentives around R&D and innovation in the next budget. I, I, I'm hoping we see that because we need that more than ever to make sure that we are growing from additional investment. You know, we, the last 10, 15 years, we have not grown from productivity improvements. We have not grown from participation. We have only grown from increased population. And we aren't going to grow from increased population in the short term for obvious reasons. So where's our growth going to come from? So if that's not a burning platform, I, I, I don't know what is. Yeah. So, so <laughs> thanks, Al. The three of you have presented a fairly um, thorny uh, maze, or a thorny, thorny needle to thread, I suppose. We need to increase our income through tax take in order to... to um, uh, pay down the deficit that's been accrued through COVID. We need to maintain international competitiveness. We need to be aware of uh, challenges of political scare campaigns um, whilst improving economic efficiency uh, to dig ourselves out of, uh, to, to dig the national economy out of a recession. Uh, those altogether seem like quite a difficult ask in any circumstances. And we're obviously doing it um, at a time when we're also dealing with a global pandemic. Um, so I suppose I guess I wanted to ask a question. You know, there is there is this concept that we have a, a opportunity because of COVID that we didn't have before, that COVID gives leaders, politicians and, and, and advocates for reform, a platform for reform that the public is more willing to, uh, to accept these sorts of reforms than they were pre-COVID. So my question, I suppose, is do you think we have that opportunity? Do you think that opportunity is real? And how long do you think it actually sticks around? If, we, if we're undertaking reforms in 2021, will, will, will people's memories of COVID be so distant that they will, in fact, uh, not accept that? And do we need to be moving quicker than perhaps politicians currently are? Look, I, I think it's fair to say that the government was caught short. Most of us were caught short by the arrival and significance of the panic, uh, the pandemic. Um, there had been no forward thought or planning about that, even though this is the fifth pandemic that just this century in the last 20 years. Um, it, it, it did prove the point that you need to be prepared and you need to be thinking longer term and strategically in a country like Australia that is so exposed to a, a pandemic or to other, other big challenges like climate change and, and so on. I think the thing that gave me great heart was how quickly people responded to that. I mean, you, the consequences of lockdowns and uh, border closures and uh, social distancing and so on were uh, adjusted to. People changed their lifestyles. They changed the way they work. They changed the way they travel. Uh, they changed what they eat. I mean, a whole lot of consequential changes that uh, in, in digitalization. I mean, I remember discussing digitalization with senior public servants. They were planning a three to five year transition. It happened in about three to five weeks. I mean, these things happened much quicker than anyone thought. So that gave me great heart. And then, of course, um, the process has revealed a lot of structural weaknesses in our federation, in, um, in supply chains. Uh, in, uh, a whole host of areas uh, that um, we're starting to recognise uh, the challenge of. And as you mentioned, population, immigration's collapsed. You know, these are big structural shifts that will take time to turn around. So there is an opportunity to reset in a number of these areas. And one of those areas should be tax. Um, you know, if you are interested in taking a longer term strategic view and uh, positioning Australia correctly, then tax has got to be part of that reset, as our attitudes to manufacturing and other industries. Uh, we haven't done a lot of that sort of strategic thinking, and that's what gave me great heart about the way we responded to um, 
to the pandemic, but I don't see it transferring to the government suddenly starting to think trans longer term. When you've got, in my experience, you've sort of got three stages in policy development. You've got to get the community to agree that the problem, the magnitude, the urgency, the challenge, if you like. Second stage is to be prepared to talk about options. And, and elevate a debate from, I don't know, kitchen table to the national domain. And then thirdly, focus on a strategy that you can deliver over a period of time. And that really should be a bipartisan ex exercise. You've got to start with a concept of where you think Australia can be or should be a couple of decades out and then come back to see what you need to do in public policy terms to get there. And uh, if you look at the realistic threats and challenges in that sort of two decade horizon, there are a lot of changes that need to be made for us to, to capitalise on that. So mm. that, isn't, that thinking hasn't filtered through to government, unfortunately. John and the, the panel, there's a, there's a saying that um, the, the policies that are adopted in a crisis are the ones that have been sitting in the, in the bottom drawer, that essentially that you don't have time in responding to, to crisis to develop and to, do, to go through a full policy development process and you essentially have to take what you've already got. Um, what have we already got? Well, you've got Ken's review. I mean, implement Ken's review. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and I, um, I would say that, wouldn't I? But actually, I think it's true. It is true. <clears throat> you know, uh, and, and I've heard people say in public debate um, during the COVID-19 crisis that, well, things have moved on in the last 10 years. Well, yes, they have. The case for implementing those reforms has become more urgent. I mean, that's, that's actually what's happened in the last 10 years. It's not that those reforms have become, in any sense, less relevant. They've become more relevant. But, but just, just uh, listening to John, and I agree with everything John said, I, I, just, I think it's worth emphasising one of the points that, that John was making, which is that, and, and go back to the comments I was making earlier, that you, know, you do need a compelling narrative, but it, the narrative has to be so compelling that it can sustain multiple reforms over multiple years. And it's not as if we haven't done this before. If you think back to um, the 1980s, and John referred to the 70s before when people were, well, people like John, not enough people, but people like John were worried uh, about the position that Australia was in. When Australia floated the dollar in December of 1983, abolished capital controls and so on, it set off a chain of events that actually the people were not prepared for. It kind of created a crisis in the 1980s, certainly by the mid-1980s, it created a crisis. This is where Keating's famous Banana Republic line came from. This was a sense of emergency, you know, something had to, be, had to happen. It focused the mind. A very compelling narrative was constructed on the basis uh, of, that, uh, of that crisis. It was so powerful that years and years later, in fact, in the middle of the recession of the early 1990s, the government, and a Labor government at that, was cutting tariffs. Imagine that. Imagine that somebody said, out of the blue, we're in a recession, let's cut tariffs. Would never have happened. Point is that the narrative that was constructed in what was perceived as a crisis in the mid-1980s was so powerful and so well understood by the Australian population that it compelled the government to continue with tariff cuts through the recession of the early 1990s. That's the sort of narrative that we need now. Interesting perspective. And, Alf, and, thoughts? and I think there's a, I, I, one of the concerns I've got is uh, up until now, the, the burning platform has been that, uh, you know, we, we, we want to get back into a surplus and we, we wanted to reduce the debt. Uh, as a result of COVID, I'm really concerned that we're going to take an attitude that our debt has grown so much that we shouldn't worry about reducing it. You know, a uh, trillion dollars, you know, close to a trillion dollars of debt. I've heard a, 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 an ex-treasurer say, well, that would take about 20 budgets to repair um, all in a row, you know, surplus. Uh, so what's the chances of that happening? And I think we're being conditioned to saying that, okay, well, we don't have to pay down this debt. We're going to grow our way out of it. But how, how the hell are you going to grow your way out of it when 
the taxes that you're supposed to reduce in order to incentivize that growth, you're very dependent on right now. The only way you can grow your way out of it is if you gradually work out another way of raising the revenue that you've got and, you know, reduce the taxes that inhibit investment. Um, and even then, uh, I'm not sure that you can ever grow your way out of a trillion dollars worth of debt. You know, at some stage, you're probably going to have to make some hard decisions about uh, starting to repay it rather than just, uh, you know, uh, allowing the economy to grow. Because to allow the economy to grow, to pay that sort of debt down, it has to have exceptional growth, right? Not your standard 3% year in, year out growth, right? So I can't see how Australia can get to that level of growth without something dramatic. I think we are in a burning house now. And I don't think we should let the politicians convince us that we're not. Can I pick up on Ken's point about the tariffs? I mean, yeah. the big difference between the late 80s, early 90s and now is that politics is such a short-term negative game. You score points on the other side, you shift blame to the other side, you don't look at these issues on their merits, you don't be constructive. Uh, we made it easy from opposition for Keating to cut tariffs because he used to tag me as Captain Zero. I was arguing for zero tariffs. So you could bring it down from 400 to 200 to 100 on shoes, for example, wouldn't make any difference. Houston <laughs> wasn't going to oppose it. And that's what you need. And if, you, if you've got the concept of a national cabinet and you put the opposition in that cabinet for the purpose of being constructive, it's a chance. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, it's going to, it's not about scoring points. People are actually, I think the electorate is now pretty sick of point scoring mm -hmm. and, and negativity when the problems are there and they're not being addressed. And, um, you know, that's the, about the only way you're going to get there now, short of Alf's idea of the commission, which uh, will take it away from politics, but then it'll make recommendations that are not necessarily picked up by either side of government. So it, it is a difficult position, but if you have a sense of the national interest, it's a term that gets bandied around all the time, but a genuine sense of the national interest in the context of maybe a 20 or 30 year view, then these things actually can be done. That's, I think, a good point. I mean, it's interesting, the National Cabinet currently doesn't actually include um, the federal opposition. Um, it sounds like, John, your thoughts is that it probably should. Yes, understanding that you are trying to find common ground on what are very, very difficult issues, very complex and difficult issues that will have to be addressed over a longer period of time. And it's counterproductive to the national interest to score points in that context rather than work together collaboratively. It's, I mean, I've been surprised by, as I said, the response of individuals, businesses, institutions and so on to COVID, the challenge of COVID, but always within a collaborative framework. So we just need to build the strength of that collaborative framework within which all the players will have a role, a role to perform. Mm. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming through. Um, one, one question I have that's come through, uh, there's been a, a, a series of proposals from a variety of sources uh, to postpone or cancel the mooted increase to superannuation. Your thoughts on this in the current environment, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Responses? I think it should go ahead. It's another longer term strategic challenge. You're talking about a long-term desire to have a retirement income system that supports the worker in their retirement. And uh, if, to the extent that you delay that process, uh, you may be giving short-term benefit, and it's a debate, you may be giving them a short-term benefit, but uh, it may try, may give you higher wages. I'm not convinced. Uh, I'm surprised very much the Reserve Bank has been prepared to argue that and politicise itself in that process. But having said that, the, the major focus is long-term strategic thinking in terms of retirement incomes, and yeah, look, it's not, a, not the best time ever to increase uh, those contributions, but you started a process, you've got to continue it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And for exactly the same reason. This is a long-term structural reform, and that's how it should be looked at. You can always mount a case on, short -term, on a short-term basis for deferring an increase uh, in that wedge between what an employee gets and what an employer pays. You can always argue that case. Um, but to do so defeats progress toward the structural reform. And I think you just have to, you just have to live with it, go through. Mm. Um, another another question's come through regarding inheritance tax. Um, it's, it's a two-parter. 
First is, is, is now a good time to be introducing an inheritance tax as a, as a alternative form of raising revenue. There's also been a proposal came out of uh, the UK of a one-off inheritance tax as a way to pay down COVID debt, essentially to, to, um, to claim a chunk from, from major estates as a, as a major one-off uh, cash injection in order to pay back some of these um, major deficits that countries around the world have, have accrued as a result of COVID. Thoughts on a, on a long-term inheritance tax, a short-term inheritance tax? Well, yeah. I, I, um, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I, I think it's a bit like the superannuation thing. You know, people are going to come up with little potshot ideas on what we should be doing right now, but not in an overall long-term strategic framework of, of what is the best thing for us, right? So, um, I mean, to some extent, we already have an inheritance tax in place with our capital gains tax. Um, the, secondly, you'd have to realise that, of course, the inheritance tax is not a tax on the person that dies. It's a tax on the, per on the people that survive that would otherwise get what that person is leaving them. And, you know, uh, the reality is that right now, the, 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 the people that are left behind uh, are the are the are the probably the people who are going to you know suffer most from from the COVID environment you know in terms of getting out of this thing, um, and if you're talking about the really rich, well the amount of tax that you're going to raise from the really rich uh, is not going to feature in the in, in the overall scheme of things. They will plan find ways of planning against it, and or get out of the country. You know, so it's just a it's just a terrible tax to be thinking about. You know, fulfilling a gap, uh, but it is symptomatic of the the environment that we're in because people need to find ways to deal with the, the current corner that we've painted ourselves into. And so, not only is there a risk that we won't go away and do the things that we should have done ten years ago, but that we'll do a whole series of little things that won't actually be much good for us. Mm. John, Ken, any reflections? Look, I, I, um, I think one of the major constraints in the current system, and it's not just the tax system, but broadly, is there's a very significant inter intergenerational transfer of wealth right now. I mean, the young and the low income earners, for example, are hit harder by the recession, the casual workers are hit, hit harder, inadequate uh, access to health and, uh, and other uh, systems and so on, disability systems and so on. So the aggregate impact is very unfair yet within the tax system there are some particularly unfair areas in terms of housing in terms of superannuation which have significant transfers in favor of the wealthy so if you're not going to go the inheritance tax route you've got to be prepared to address the unfairness in the in the ex existing system uh, in so many ways and in so many as in terms of access and effectiveness and um, you know here we have a situation where as i just said the young are hit particularly hard uh, low income earners are hit particularly hard by by um, uh, the recession and uh, and the, and the system yet we have a massive age care problem <laughs> at the same time there are people within the age care group that have done particularly well out of the system and and you know it is possible to go right through and pay no tax on retirement uh, you know at the same time you know, it's one of a very rare superannuation system where you get a tax break to put money in, you get a tax break on the fund management during the period it's in there, and you get a tax break when you take it out. It's the only system in the world that does that. They're, those sort of inequities need, need to be addressed uh, if you're not going to go the inheritance tax route. And equally, asset tests need to be more significant in terms of access to some of the, the benefits to, uh, to actually make sure that they are distributed more to those in need. So I think it's a very complicated issue um, to, to address in this, in this country. You saw in the last election the su suggestion that uh, an attack on negative gearing combined with the cash refunds on uh, franking credits uh, was going to really be code for wealth tax or code for death duties. Uh, and that, that, um, that killed the Labor Party's chances, I think, of being elected. Mm. I'm going to oh, jump in, Ken. Sorry. No, no, no. No, no, no. I was, I was really going to uh, agree very much with uh, with uh, John's remarks. Um, the re when you think about an inheritance tax or the case for an inheritance tax, it, it really forces you to ask the question: What's wrong with our present 
income tax system and what's wrong with the means testing that we have for transfer payments. So you know, income tests and assets tests, and, and would it be better to have um, uh, a better and in fact uniform means testing arrangement for transfer payments? Mm. Uh, and indeed that was a recommendation of our review 10 years ago. Um, you have a more comprehensive uh, means test um, and a more coherent uh, means test. And I think had that, had that been done, and by the way, we did recommend a reform of the taxation arrangements for superannuation that would have dealt with not all of the issues that John has drawn attention to, but, a, but at least some. Um, and it would have been a progressive taxation treatment for superannuation. I think had those things been done, um, there'd be less interest in the question of an inheritance tax. Well, I can I can see a few people on the on the call who are who are involved in politics who who work for decision makers uh, folks if you're listening Ken's available to advise on on some work that he's got that is sitting in the bottom shelf and ready to roll. Um, we've probably got one time for one last question, and I'm going to make it a, a, a ask for brief responses to it. Um, what has loomed large over this conversation is the very large deficit and the need to pay it back at some stage. Um, one conversation that's been had is this question of modern monetary theory and essentially the idea that um, we don't need to pay back um, deficits and that, that, that there, are, there are models of essentially making the debt uh, irrelevant or, or disappear. Does that have any, any play in, in, the, the, in a real debate around tax reform? What's your reflections on, on modern monetary theory? Well, um, maybe I could jump in here um, um look <laughs> forget it um in the first place it would require the government to um to uh take monetary policy back from the reserve bank clearly it would require that um is that really what we want to do do we do we really want to send that sort of signal or send a signal of that sort to international investors in the Australian economy that the government has decided that it's going to take monetary policy back from the Reserve Bank. We're no longer going to have an independent monetary policy uh, in Australia. Um, I think um, I think now is not the time for it. I'm not sure there'd ever be uh, a time for it. So that's the first point. Second point is the government can borrow for 10 years at less than 1% per annum. Um, now, modern monetary theory would say, well, why not do it for zero? Sure. But really, if, if there's an investment that's not worth funding at, say, 0.9% per annum for 10 years, is it really going to be worth funding at 0% uh, for 10 years? Um, I think it's actually um, more an answer in search of a problem. Yeah, I've been very suspicious of magic puddings all my life. Um, and as you, when you sit down and think about the extreme application of, 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 of the monetary theory that's being uh, propagated, you have the Treasury basically spending the money on behalf of the government, the government spending the money through the Treasury, and uh, the funding of that being picked up entirely by the Reserve Bank. So on a very happy day into the future, the Reserve Bank and the Treasury, under the auspices of the government, sit down and just write off that debt. Uh, you know, that's possible and debt forgiveness may end up being part of the solution of the debt crisis. But when you can borrow for such low money and at such low rate, and Ken says 10 years, I mean, the Austrians just borrowed 100 year money at 0.88%. You know, in that world, why wouldn't you, if you can productively invest that money in infrastructure, economic and social infrastructure, you could have an infrastructure revolution in this country if you did that properly. And that's a far better alternative than pretending that you're sitting on a magic pudding without consequences, because it will have consequences. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, you're very nervous about those suggestions. It's an easy way, as Ken said, it's a, it's a solution looking for a problem. It's, it's an easy way to get the system asked backwards. Mm. Alf, some final but, thoughts? Uh, look, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, pretty much what I said earlier, that I think there's a danger that the burning house that we're in, you know, we're not going to realise how bad it is if we convince ourselves that having a trillion dollars worth of debt is not a problem because interest rates are really low. You know, we have to prosecute the fact that we are, have a burning platform for change. Uh, and and if, we lose, if we lose that, we'll lose the impetus 
to, to make the changes that we're talking about. Mm. Mm. Wow, some really great uh, topics we've covered up in this hour. Thank you uh, to, to everyone who's tuned in. Thank you to John, to Ken, to Alf. Really appreciate your time. It's, it's genuinely wonderful to spend time with big brains like yourselves. Um, so uh, we'll leave it there. It is one o'clock, um, so we'd like to finish on time if we can. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your thoughts. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. To everybody, we'll see you at the next event.